Tua Tata, everyone. Um, so today I'm going to talk about some work that we did in uh, Vanuatu earlier this year um, with the focus of creating um, both historical and current climate maps um, from Vanuatu. Um, and before I get into the details, it's important to recognise the collaboration that um, essentially made this project um, you know, happen, um, and that was with the South Pacific Regional Environment Program, um, who were the funders, and then uh, the Vanuatu Meteorology and Geohazards Department, who are collaborators. Uh, and the key outputs for the project were a compendium or atlas of um, maps of the past climate for Vanuatu, um, and a suite of, of current climate maps as well. Um, and with the overarching sort of aim is to create climate data products that support the resilient uh, development in Vanuatu. Now this slide um, gives a, a, a graphical, um, well graphic from WMO, or the um, World Meteorology. Um, they, the work that we do kind of fits into providing um, weather and climate services. Um, and what's required is, you know, often we, we build our application, uh, our products off um, observations or sometimes models or, or forecasting. In this instance, it's uh, predominantly off observational data. But that all feeds into a broader context of providing um, or adding value to the information so that the end users get something that they can um, they can utilize to um, to make decision for decision making and that's the you know where we would like to we do a lot of our work is um, we have teams that work on, on collecting the data and we work um, collaboratively with organizations in country to do that um, but in our team we work with with the data um, and some end users to to define and create um, products that might support their their work in the and, um, and the sectors that they work in their communities. So this reasonably complicated uh, diagram um, shows some of the, the sort of network of where the, the data is coming from. Um, so in, in the Pacific, we have um, a network where we help support NEWA, help support um, the deployment of automatic weather stations, but um, other organisations um, also do similar sorts of work. Um, and they also have manual um, weather stations. So the graphic shows sort of the, the complexities of, of sending data from the field, I mean, you know, via satellite or via the um, uh, mobile networks, um, or we have manual weather observers that um, can key data directly into um, remote servers as well. And all that information has to go through a telemetry server and then into various databases and, um, you know, data pathways uh, for us to be able to utilise it. And a key um, element of this, or where I spend a lot of my time working, is creating products that sit within a uh, piece of software called Clydesk um, that's been developed uh, by NEWA with, in partnership with Catalyst. And the purpose of, of Clydesk is to provide a web sort of interface for users to come and see a catalogue of products and then at which they can initiate or, or review, um, and that's sort of shown on the far side. Um, so this, this map shows the you know, current open climate stations in, in Vanuatu, and it, show, it, it, it shows a lot of, of points on the map. Um, however, not all of them have a really extensive or, or, or long um, climate record, which is required to make um, to make the, these these mapping products. Um, so, I, you know, I included the map just to show that um, you know what sort of instrumentation or, or how, you know how many instruments might be out there collecting data. But it's important that we have a, a long record to be able to do something um, useful with it. Um, and I mentioned the uh, Clydesk client, um, and, and this is some software that we deploy either in country or in the cloud um, for our partners and collaborators to be able to log into um, and view a catalogue of products uh, which they can they can select and run uh, through a, a map view or for, through just a, a list of products that they're interested in. Um, and these, the maps that we've made in this project, um, you know, the idea is that they become available via this platform, but also um, we can utilize uh, Clydes to distribute them elsewhere as, as well. So we have a bit of a track record of doing this type of work. So um, maybe 10 years ago or so, I uh, was involved in creating um, climatology or 30 year uh, climatology maps for New Zealand. Um, so in New Zealand, we have an extensive network of climate stations and NEWA uh, managers um, and curates a lot of that data and stores a big, a, a big archive of it in, in the climate database. And from there, we, we established a, a, a methodology um, using various bits of um, open source software um, to, well, and closed source um, and licensed software as well, to interpolate that data using um, elevation 
um, as a covariate um, to be able to give a, a sort of a climate surface across the country. Um, and we did similar work in um, Samoa, uh, which I think is about 2014. Um, and this project is kind of like a continuation of a, a similar approach. So uh, what do we need to create these maps? Well, ideally we need um, a good long 30 year record of data for climate stations. Um, but that's difficult, right? So it's hard to, particularly in, in, in the Pacific, in the nation where you've got islands everywhere, that it's hard to go and maintain that, that data. It's costly to do that. So um, although ideally we'd like 30 years of data, we'll, we'll, make, we'll make the best of whatever data we can, we can get to get the, the best outcome. Um, we want representative climate stations. Uh, so quite often you'll find a weather station at an at a, um, airport or by some infrastructure in a, in a village. Uh, but for this type of method to work reasonably well, you also need them in more remote locations, like higher altitudes, um, and, and well distributed across, across the country. Uh, we also need some topographic data. Um, so in this instance, it doesn't have to be um, you know, high resolution. It, um, I've just used um, the ASTA um, Global DEM because it provides enough uh, resolution and it's available across the Pacific. So if we wanted to do a similar work elsewhere, we can take the method and, and move it along. Um, I use predominantly Python for a lot of the data handling and, and data wrangling um, with pandas and X-ray when I'm working with raster, um, raster data sets. Um, and then the, the general suite of tools like GDAL and Rasterio and things like that to do more of the spatial analysis. But one key um, tool that we use in this particular workflow is um, ANU Spline. And that provides the, the well, the, the spatial interpolation of the climate station data, but you can, the, the value that ANU Spline provides is that you can, well, it was, it was written to do this particular um, cl uh, you know, climate data um, interpolation, but allows to have covariates, so you can use more than one or multiple um, input data sets to, to kind of weight and um, manipulate the, the surface that's, um, that's returned. So, uh, like temperature, for example, um, you know, you get a lapse rate with height, so there's quite a strong relationship between elevations. So um, you can use the, um, tools like ANU Spline to, to basically um, do that for us. Um, and then all the mapping, I used CardoPy, which is sort of extension of um, Matplotlib, so all the maps you might recognize if you've done any plotting in, in Python look um, very s similar. Um, I did, well, it took me a while to get some my head around how best to do um, spatial mapping with CardoPy, because uh, sort of restricts where legends and things can be, but um, I think in the end we did a, a reasonable job. Um, and then just a you know, general contextual spatial layers that are useful in, in the map. So this goes back to, this slide goes back to a point I was making about having a, a good representation of climate stations in the country. And uh, it's a figure that my colleague uh, prepared. But essentially, if you've got some terrain and you've got prevailing wind direction, you know, you want to position some climate stations in places where you're most likely to get sort of different differences in temperature and, and um, humidity and rainfall. So in this instance, you'll get the, the, the prevailing weather coming from, I guess it would be maybe we think of it the, from the west or from the left. And as it, as, the cool there, as it rises, you might get all the rain on one side of the, of the, the terrain, and then it'll be much drier and warmer on the other. But if you don't have any instrumentation there, um, you don't actually know for sure um, if that's what, what you're getting. So um, it's important to ensure that you've got um, a good coverage, um, you know, and particularly at higher altitudes. Um, there's a few stations that we, we you know, we, we've got the right kind of distribution of data. And there's another graph that shows the same sort of thing, uh, with your prevailing winds and then raining on one side and, and having a rain shadow on the other. So this is, uh, slide represents the, the annual spline type of, of, of workflow. So we, if you imagine the red dots being the climate stations, um, and then the grid underneath, um, perhaps the, the elevation data, and then it's weaving sort of a surface in between it, and you can, um, using parameters, you can decide how tightly you want your surface to match up with the climate stations. But that's essentially what ANU Spline is, is doing. And so just a, a slide goes over sort of the processing steps. So I, uh, you know, I use Python to go and retrieve the data from uh, the Clyde database, which is where um, uh, it's, a, it's a BOM um, data, uh, database that's installed across the Pacific to archive a lot of climate station data. So the first step is to, to extract all of that. Um, then I use the WMO um, guidelines for deriving um, monthly 
average rainfall and temperature statistics. Um, now they have quite strict uh, sort of guidelines in there with how much data can be missing. Um, so I've, I've tried to uh, utilize that as best I can, but um, at the same time, we want to preserve as much information as, as we've got. So I have to be reasonably flexible. Um, then I use like a point on grid extraction tool to uh, extract the elevation data for my DEM to assign it to my climate station locations, um, create some ANU spine configuration files and then run ANU spine to generate my historical monthly rainfall and air temperature erasers. Um, and then with those monthly grids, I can combine those to create the wet and dry season outputs. Um, and then lastly, you know, using Python and Ocado Pi, I was able to create some, some map outputs. Um, in addition to that, uh, we wanted to be able to create some, um, some maps that represented um, different phases of the El Nino Southern Oscillation Index, because it's quite a key driver in the Pacific, but also globally. So at the moment, I think we're in El Nino um, conditions. So uh, for La Nina, uh, you, if, if looking at the top, you get uh, more warm water on the west of, um, of the Pacific. And you might expect you know, higher temperatures and more rainfall as a result. Um, and then I think the middle uh, shows sort of neutral conditions or, or sort of normal. And then the bottom is El Nino where more warm water is heading uh, eastward. Um, so we get uh, cooler but, but perhaps drier. And that's what we're hoping to see in the, uh, in the maps. Um, so to do this, we had a long record of uh, the su um, Southern Oscillation Index data, which um, I averaged over, I think, moving average of like five months or something like that, and then use a threshold to decide whether a month would be um, El Nino, La Nino, or, or neutral, and then some additional filtering. But because of that filtering, um, the 30-year the record wasn't really sufficient to give us enough data, so I had to extend that out and basically use as much data as I could out of Clyde to be able to get um, months that fit, or data that fit within those um, L um, end zone months. So here's some example maps. Um, so uh, these are for, uh, um, I think it's the same uh, province in, in Vanuatu, and it's just showing the difference between, say, a, a, a wetter month in March um, to something sort of in, in between, sh I guess, the shoulder, and then a, a, a drier uh, month being August. And um, you can see that the, the interpolation is it sort of followed the terrain. Now, it's an interpolation, right? So it's not this is not measured information, so it should be in interpreted as, as that, right? It's an it's a it's an image of of um, the, the spatial distribution of what the, the rainfall um, is like based on the the station data that we have available, and it can be improved with um, you know providing additional data sets or uh, sorry additional climate stations if they if they were installed. And then monthly um, temperature, so. I think we've got sort of a, no, a standard kind of month in November, um, a, dry, a warmer February, and then a, and a cooler August um, for different province. And then maps showing um, the difference between the wet and dry season. So you can see that um, significantly more rainfall um, during the wet season than the dry, which you, which you'd expect, um, and also more more rain at higher altitudes, which is also something that you would expect. And then wet and dry season um, temperature difference as well. It might be a bit hard to see in the projector, um, but the, the the dry season is a bit cooler than the than the wet. Now comparing for those ENSO um, conditions, um, so this is for for rainfall. So the I'd, what we were hoping to see was more rain in La Nina month uh, and less in, in El Nino. And I think that, you know we've we've shown that in in these maps that that's something that. Um, is, is observed in the data, which is, um, which is good. Um, and then looking at from the dry season, um, again, the same relationships there. So we've got a bit more rain in, in La Nina. Um, and then the wet season te temperature. So one thing that I think we noted was there wasn't as much variation in temperature in the temperature maps, and uh, we had fewer climate stations uh, for, for that mapping. So. Um, you know, it's a good start, and I think, um, you know, as more uh, climate stations are deployed, uh, we could review these, these maps in the future, and maybe that would show um, s s different. But also in the tropics, you know, there's less temperature range. Like in New Zealand, 
you know, we get this is where I'm from in Christchurch. It gets very cold in the in the winter and uh, you know frosty, and then uh, can be very very warm in the summer. Uh, within the tropics, that that range of temperatures a bit, you know, it's, it's squeezed. We don't get it quite so cool, and um, so that might be some another reason why we don't see quite so much variation. And then um, you know, the dry season temperature map is another example. So moving on. Um, those provide like a nice contextual um, climate data for the uh, for the region for Vanuatu, and it's nice to be able to, to visualise that. Um, but this, so this next step was actually looking at well, what about the current climate, and you know, uh, with with some images of the current climate, you know, you can compare it to to the um, historical data to see well how you know how is this unusual or um, you know is this is it even wetter you know, than normal or, or not. So to create um, the current climate maps, this was done slightly different. So we have a, an island climate update um, that the forecasting team pulled together. And um, as part of that, they have access to satellite precipitation data that's uh, freely available from, from NASA. And it covers the entire Pacific. Uh, I think it covers the whole, the, the whole world. Um, but we extract just the, the Pacific uh, region of interest. And it provides precipitation, precipitation data only. So we don't have a temperature product. Um, unfortunately, um, so this um, this mapping you know, is mostly focused on just the, um, the rainfall, the precipitation component. But we also need to have good uh, near real time station data coming in to be able to compare with that. And um, and sometimes you know with this, with data coming in from the field, um, we do have issues with sensors or with the communication network. So we don't always have access to that um, you know real time um, data feeds. Um, they can sort of come in come and go. So that, but it is something that. Um, is highly useful for this type of mapping. Um, we're using the same sort of tools, uh, Python Pandas X-Array, um, and I'm using the, to, in order to define a baseline or um, the historical mean, I'm utilizing the, the, the gridded data that I've made earlier. So I've already done all that work, creating the statistics and mapping it. Um, so I can utilize that by um, basically extracting, um, you know, my, my historical rainfall values per month. Um, for station data to do a comparison and create an, an anomaly. Um, and I'm using the same types of um, spatial analysis, uh, analysis tools as well in Python, um, GDAL, Rusterio, GeoPandas, and ag again using Cardify. So a little bit about the, the satellite data. So it covers the, the globe. It's available from, from NASA. It gives uh, precipitation accumulation, but also the anomaly for the past 30, 60, 90, 180, and 365 day periods. Um, but by, by nature, because it's like top down, the satellite derived, it's, it, there is some uncertainty that you need to um, be aware of. Uh, but um, for a continuous data set that covers a wide area, it's, um, you know, it, it's, it, it is really useful for us. So uh, to create these maps, um, I basically take uh, subsets of automatic weather station data, um, and I subset it for the 30, 60, 90, 100, and 365 day periods. Um, I determine the, the averages of the rainfall over those times, or the accumulation, um, and then I ex extract the historical average rainfall from those grids, so that's something I can compare it with. That gives me my rain, or I can then calculate the rainfall um, accumulation of rainfall anomaly values at the station levels, and then use Cardify again to create create a, a you know, sort of a suite of maps. So I'll step through some examples. Um, so we've got, um, well, I applied some contouring to make it look more attractive, I guess. Um, but so either, either option is available within in Clydesk. Um, so for this period, you can see it's been, you know, they've had quite a bit of rainfall out in the ocean and, and in the north, um, a bit less um, on land. Um, and then as we step out, you can sort of see that the, the difference is, um, I mean, the, the scale, the legend changes each time because as the period extends, there's more and more rain, so I have to be um, dynamic in that respect. Um, but you, it's just um, some examples of the maps, I guess, essentially that are being produced. Um, and I'll just sort of click through them. That's the whole whole year. Um, and then um, to, as well as having you know, the accumulation, it's nice to know well, how does that differ um, to what we might normally expect. Um, and this is what the next set of maps provide. Um, so we can see in this one that we've, it's been a bit drier than normal, perhaps in the northern part of, of Vanuatu, and then and in the southern, um, <coughs> southern part, but in the middle, maybe it's close to normal. Uh, and that's 
essentially um, it. My collection of maps. The only other thing is um, I wrote a little piece of uh, JavaScript so that we can deploy a little, um, I guess, map selector. Oh, sorry. In um, in Clyde S so that users can go and they don't have to sort of go through a, a, a directory structure to find the maps. They can choose the products they're after and it will just come and show them. And that's it. Thanks for listening. Thank you. Thanks very much, James. Thank you. We've got questions from the audience. Over here. Ian. Hi. Thank you. Nice presentation. Um, quick question about uh, a new spline. Yeah. Um, there's there's lots of interpolation software out there. So what's a new spline doing different, different. compared to like Saga's yeah. B spline or something like that? Yeah. So a lot of the traditional splining or interpolation just work on I guess a whole bunch of points with values on it, and it will just create a surface between them. But I need a tool that can take additional parameters to be able to influence how that interpolation is done, and that's what a new spline can do. I do know there are more tools that can do that now. I've done, you know, in the past, I thought, well, can, you know, there are other tools and something else that I can use instead. The reason why we stick with a new spline is we already have a track record of using it, so we want some consistency. Um, there are, I've, I tried a tool in SciPy that sort of did the same sort of thing, um, not quite the same, and, uh, and there's a 3D creeing tool that um, Esri pulled out a couple of years ago that you can also do similar stuff, so I think um, there are more options now than there have been in the past. Um, and uh, we've been working in partnership with a, a data scientist who's been looking at machine learning tools for doing the same type of thing, and it's promising, um, but I don't think we're quite there yet, maybe another year or so. Thanks. One more question. 